So thank you so much for that, um, for that great talk. And she will be back up for a panel. And I hope if you haven't addressed it on your panel, I hope somebody will ask her about imposter syndrome, uh, which she wrote about for Slate and um, is, is a great topic. And uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions. So I am incredibly thrilled and honored to be able to moderate a discussion with Carol Greider, who, as I'm sure you know, is the winner of the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery. For the discovery of how chromosomes are protected by telomeres and the enzyme telomerase. Did I pronounce that right? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. She's a Daniel Nathans Professor and Director of Molecular Biology and Genetics at the Institute, Institute for Basic Biomedical Sciences at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, so she, she runs her own lab there. And the, I, I was privileged to be able to interview her in her office um, a few days after she had won the Nobel Prize. I was writing a piece on her for the Washington Post. And I can say that her office was full of flowers and a card from her daughter's, many cards from her daughter's elementary school class, one of which congratulated her for finding a cure for telomerase. <laughs> and um, and one, of which, one of which said that her prize is just, quote, so cool, I can't even think about stuff. Um, which I think shows the power of, the power of example. Um, and I'm also honored to be able to talk to Nancy Hopkins, who is an incredibly distinguished science, scientist, that, as I'm sure you all know. She is the Amgen, Inc. Professor of Molecular Biology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her current research interest is cancer prevention. She has been a constant advocate for women in STEM. In the 1990s, she instigated a groundbreaking report at MIT into systemic discrimination against women on the science faculty. As Dr. Clave indicated, they have made enormous progress in um, advancing women in STEM, and I'm going to ask her to, to talk about that and share her insights. I, I just wanted to start by asking Carol Greider if you could, if you could just tell us where you were and what you were doing when you got the early morning call saying that you had won the Nobel Prize in science? Well, this is a, a story that has been reported on a, a number of times. Um, um, so the phone call comes usually early in the morning because in Sweden it's in the, more in the afternoon, so it was early in the morning. And when the phone rang, it is true that I was folding laundry, but that's not something about the fact that I'm, you know, a woman scientist trying to multitask. It's just about the fact that it was a Monday morning and the laundry wasn't done yet. <laughs> right. Although you, you did confess to thinking that was the same year that the president won the Nobel Prize. And you did confess to thinking that he probably wasn't folding laundry. When well, I actually, I, I did say that three days later when <laughs> Obama won the, the yes. Peace Prize three days later. Right. And, and I happened to say, I bet he wasn't folding laundry as a joke, not because he's not a woman, <laughs> because he's the president. He shouldn't be folding laundry. But it ended up in the newspaper. Yes. And I have had to answer questions oh, when I was vetted by the White House for a position that I was going to be on on a panel. They said, did you really say? <laughs> and I had to admit that I did question the fact that the president wasn't folding laundry. <laughs> but I, I, I would like for you to then both talk about it, the fact that it, as, we, as we examine what have been the barriers for women in the STEM fields, the question of, of combining work and family is something that comes up. And, the, and the, um, Dr. Clave has talked about, in fact, that it can be quite a flexible field, but it has also been challenging. Um, Nancy Hopkins, I wondered if you could talk about, as the changes that you instituted at or helped bring about at MIT, where did the question of, of combining work and family come in? How much of a barrier was that when you looked at it, and what did you do to uh, alleviate the situation? Uh, it was such a large barrier that you didn't talk about it. I literally could not even mention the word baby on um, campus. <laughs> you just did not bring it up. We're talking about when. So that's the thing. You have to remember I'm pretty old. So um, <laughs> this is going back a ways. Um, so it would have been as late as the 1994-5, or mid-90s. You did not say baby on campus. Because if you raised the issue, it might imply that either you regretted not having children or you were thinking about having them. And actually, uh, at that time, if the dean, the dean said he wanted to do a woman a favor and make sure she got tenure, he hid the fact she had had children. People didn't believe you could be a great scientist and a mother. 
So it was kept secret. So people kept the fact they were pregnant secret. So that's where we were. <laughs> it's a long time. I mean, in, it's the not, in the mid 1990s. In the mid 90s. Okay. Not that long ago, but it is a different world. So I think one of the most important changes that happened at MIT was putting babies on the table. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you do that? You brought in some babies? Uh, we, um, we did, and uh, it was a major, major change. You know, it's hard to believe for young people, hard to believe, so this is good. Um, we did, and the president and the provost took it on as an issue a few years later. It was not until 2001, and um, discussed it with the whole university. We're going to have new family policies. They'd be made uniform through all of MIT. We'd make it so standard that a woman could take a leave, and it would be like taking a sabbatical. There was no longer a stigma attached to it. But it was a major change. And then they put daycare in the middle. So now there's babies being pushed around the campus everywhere, men, women pushing babies on the campus. It's totally normal. <laughs> just so has it been completely normalized? Is there no longer a stigma then attached to parenthood? I think I'd say that's true. I, I do. I think people now know that women actually bear children. And, and, <laughs> and, and can remain a committed scientist. And, yes, and the difference is that uh, in my generation, uh, unlike uh, the fabulous talk we just heard, I think many women didn't go into it because they couldn't imagine you could do both. And of the women who did go into it, more than half didn't have children. That is completely different today. So the women who go into it now, young women, almost all of them have children. I think it still is hard. It's too hard. Yeah. So, Carol Breider, I think you're, you were probably starting, you, your children are what now? Are they teen? 14, 17. Right. So it would have been about that era that you were having. So is that the way you felt? I mean, was there a stigma attached to parenthood, to motherhood when you were um, at the beginning of your career? or? Um, if there was, I was ignoring it. I was you know, probably like Maria. I was just like, well, that's, I was just going to do that anyway, <laughs> um, and find find a way to do it. But I, I do know that um, that you know even even today, it's very difficult for people to figure out you know how to manage that and, and what are the expectations. And um, and it's not just in in science. This isn't just a women in science issue. This is you know across the board. Um, these are these are issues that f face you know all professional women or working women that. Um, how society views uh, the women and the, the role, and you know, is it really true that um, you can split the job? You know, people say, "Oh, I can split the job," and you know, my husband's gonna be very helpful, and then you know, they end up taking on more responsibility, and and that's in part because we we're not working in a vacuum here. We're working in our whole society in general, and and I think in general in our society there still is more expectation on the women as the caregivers. And can you talk about during the course of your career, I think you've taken concrete steps to facilitate the work family um, challenge for, for women and for parents, both in your own lab and when you were at Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Then? I think what I've done has been very, very small steps. I mean, compared to what we heard, you know, actions that, that people took, like Maria said, uh, very directly. Um, but I try to, um, you know, do what I can to, to be, you know, the role model, not just as a department chair. So when I became department chair, I had no aspirations to be department chair. You know, I was asked, would you please put your name in the hat? And I thought, why would I want that job? But then I thought about it. And, um, and I remember that when I finally decided I was offered the position and I, I, I decided to take the position, I signed it with the pen that was given to me by the American Association of University Women because it was a statement that I was making you know, to be there and to be on the committees. Um, and you know, small things like you know, when my son had a play, I would leave the lab and say, I got to go. Charles is in the play. And then I would come back later on or you know, come back and work uh, in the evening. And um, so just showing that that can be OK. And, right. and I do think that you know, as a, a woman in science, it's actually probably a lot easier uh, for us than it is for, for instance, professional women in banking or, or something where you have to be at a particular place at a particular time. Um, I can get my work done and, 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 um, and evaluated on what the product is, not so much how many hours uh, I'm there. And so it, it, it is. You know, I tell people that want to be professional women, you got to come to the sciences because it's much, so much more flexible uh, than in other areas. Right. To an outsider, it does look as though it would be, it would potentially be a flexible field. Mm -hmm. Journalism actually has become much more flexible uh, over the past 20 years because of, because of the ability to telecommute and to work from home and to mm -hmm. be flexible and work in different places. Um, 
but uh, it is shocking, actually, for me. I had my first child in 1995. I was working for the Washington Post. There was not the stigma. Mean, well, I wouldn't say it was easy, but there was not the stigma that you describe in the mid-'90s, where, where you were not even able to, to say that you were pregnant. Um, so it is, it is kind of shocking to me to hear that that was, that was the mid-'90s when that was happening, and, and that it's changed so much in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, yeah. Very encouraging. I mean, I do think part of it is that the academic schedule has this very tight window, and so and they overlap. So women were having children in this period when they were also trying to get tenure, and so they had a family leave policy, and no woman had taken it and gotten tenure, and so women, of course, decided they shouldn't do that because <laughs> it must be that you can't do it. So it was really opening the question, putting it on the table, talking about it, and it is amazing how fast the stigma was removed. I think. Yeah, okay. All you have to do is talk about it. And can Almost. You, can you talk about the, really, all you had to do was bring it up? And kind of. <laughs> <laughs> can you talk about the, the way that the landscape has changed? I mean, one of the, one of the uh, as a lay person, I'm not a science reporter, I'm not a scientist, but um, I think many of us yeah, from the outside think of science as, um, as these lone individuals um, who are geniuses sort of toiling alone making great discoveries and in fact science is a very clubby you know relationships are incredibly important in science being admitted to institutions being admitted to societies i mean for hundreds of years the challenge was to be admitted to the university to be allowed into the professional society those sorts of barriers now have have fallen largely, we're admitted, and, and yet you have tracked in the course of your career that the, the clubbiness has not gone away. The clubs have changed, right? So your latest work has been looking at scientific advisory boards and whether women are invited to be on these prestigious, potentially quite lucrative boards of private corporations where, um, and, and, and you have found that in fact they are not. So it's sort of like, you know, it's like, like medicine, I guess, where you're constantly, you know, trying to find cures for, and sometimes, right, right, viruses are morphing, or um, the, <laughs> the, the, it, it, trying, to, mm -hmm. trying to solve a problem that, that, that changes. changes. So where, where are we in terms of um, dispelling the clubbiness or opening the clubs? What I see is that in the, the universities took the problem on, and they solved it by setting up uh, methods of monitoring. So they check the data, <laughs> they look at the numbers, and they watch the hiring very carefully. And if they see something slipping, they fix it. Right. The good universities, that's what they've done. And because they've had to or because they've wanted to? Well, that was really what the discovery was, that you could open the door, let people in, but there were all these barriers once they got through the door. So you had to go and address each one of those, and you had to keep tracking it. And I believe, we've also seen, if the university stops tracking, it goes right back. Okay. Okay, so what you see is, that where it cannot be tracked, so for example, men who found companies or, sit or choose people for scientific advisory boards, when people are left with their own devices, it looks like the 1950s. Right. So, I mean, I happen to have some data here. I love data. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just telling Carol, I mean, if you look at the companies that went public, biotech, last year in Boston, and you look at who are the founders of the scientific advisory board members, um, the management, there was 132 men and what was it? I had that number. 12, 12 women. Yeah. Okay, so we have 70% biology majors, 50% PhDs in biology, this is MIT numbers, and you know about 30% of the faculty. When you go and look who are being invited to do this, and it's like 5%. So, uh, how do you monitor that? Right. Because this is individual behavior, and that behavior is reflecting what's going on every day in those labs. That's just not an accident. And so I asked the, these men, well, how did that happen? And they're shocked to see the numbers because the company starts, one man talks to another man, venture capitalists come and seek him out. There's two or three people. They invite two or three people. There's a tiny number of people. There happens to be no women. Who would think about twice about it? The next company starts the same way, and the next one, in the, and suddenly you look at the cumulative data, and there aren't any women there. So what do you do about that? That's a tough problem. And I believe that's really what is affecting women at every step of the way. It's that little bit of marginalization. And you know, science is, as you just said, very interactive. And being left out is really not good. 
Thanks, so you talk about the effect of a little bit, one person gets on a board a man, or starts a company, and then the, the effects of a little bit of marginalization and a little bit of marginalization. And, and Carol, you talked about that in, in my interview with you as well. Um, and it can work. So, so if at every step of the review process, and science is a field where there are so many levels of review, right? I mean, there's so many um, degrees and, and positions, and you can be weeded out, weeded out. That was the phrase that you used, a little bit of weeding and a little bit of weeding. And so um, women can get weeded at, at every step, and it has kind of, a, I think, an, I, I, I don't know if it's exponential or reverse exponential, but can you talk about, in your field, telomere biology, you, you talk about something called the founder effect, which I think is, is kind of the opposite, where when women are in a field at the beginning, and then they start to hire each other and attract each other in a way that encourages the, the field that, encur that is inclusive. Can you talk about what happened in your own field? Well, people would often, you know, remark when I would go to meetings and I'd be one of the speakers on a, like American Society for Cancer Research or something like that, and frequently I was, you know, one of 40, only female speaker, one of 40, uh, and yet people would say to me, it's remarkable, there's a large number of women in your field, right? And here's this tiny little field over here, and we do tend to have more uh, women in that field, but it's this, you know, tiny little microcosm. Um, but the, the, the thought is that the reason that there are uh, more women in that field is not because some people said, well, maybe studying the telomere is more attractive to women. Like, why would that be? <laughs> why studying the centromere isn't attractive to women? And, and so um, it, it seemed to be that it really started with a, a very prominent man, uh, Joe Gall, who was a, a person that was very supportive uh, of women. And he had a lot of uh, trained, a, a large number of now very prominent women. Um, and then those women went out and started their own labs, and um, there perhaps were a few more women in their labs than there were men. And so that started this, this little um, area where there was one field that tended to have more women in it. Now, admittedly, once it got popular and it took off, and I was recently showing a, a chart of the number of publications with the word telomere in it uh, in, the, in PubMed, and it goes like this. And you know, of course, then when the asymptote uh, goes up, you know, now it's I would say seventy percent men. Hmm. Um, so yes, it started off um, that way, and and it was just by you know a little bit of um, of the seeding, basically the jackpot effect, starting with Joe Gall. Right. Um, but you know, for a long time, with the the data that people were saying, you know, there aren't very many uh, women at the higher levels in the STEM fields. And um, I remember when when Nancy came to to Hopkins and gave a talk when you were. Uh, your report, and what I loved about that was that it was you know so data driven. It's like okay, let's start at the data and and look at what's going on. Um, and so um, when you now go back and you look about the data, um, why aren't there so many women at the top? People would say, oh, there's not enough coming in the pipeline. There aren't enough women coming in. And yes, we do have to encourage young women to go into STEM fields, but that wasn't the case at all because when I was a graduate student, we were 50 percent. Back 25 years ago, 50% of us were, were women. Right. Um, but then you go to the next step, and it's you know 30% at the um, maybe 40% in the postdoc level, 30% at the assistant prof prof professor level, and then it goes um, down and down as you go up um, the um, the ladder. Um, and it's very clear that it's not that it's a pipeline issue; there aren't enough coming in, but that it's a leaky pipeline. Is that more women come out uh, than at than men do at each step? And there's a very uh, important report that I want to give a little um, plug to. Please. That is the uh, American Association for University Women published this report a couple years ago, Why So Few? And if you're data-driven, as Nancy and I are, um, there is a ton of uh, really important studies uh, in, this, uh, in this report that talks about why are there so few women in STEM. Uh, and they make a good point that it's not one thing. There are many different uh, reasons why you would have people leaking out of the pipeline. But this is where they clearly say it's a leaky pipeline. It's not that there aren't enough coming in. Right, right. Um, so I, I guess this will be my, my last question, then, then open it up. There, there was a report that came out recently suggesting that we can talk about the external barriers and the clubbiness, and it's clear that it, it, that it, it still exists, and, and I would never challenge that. There, there was a, also a study that came out suggesting that one, women, one reason women might drift out of the STEM fields is because of, and I think uh, 
Dr. Clive, this speaks to your work on imposter syndrome, is because women have very high standards for themselves, tend to have very high standards, and are very, um, can be daunted by the fact that grades in the STEM field can, are not A's very easily. And so the, the possibility that, that female students are, are attached to the idea of doing well and making A's and that, and that it's daunting to be in a field where that's not happening. So there may be a kind of a psychological drift away from these There's fields data in here. because of a kind of a perfectionism <laughs> that, and, and I, I, I don't necessarily think that that's innate. I think that, that um, mm -hmm. well, women in some cases are right to fear failure or, or not doing as well in certain fields because I think traditionally we've been punished, I think, harder for making mistakes or experiencing setbacks. But I don't know, what do you think about that, uh, about that kind of psychological factor? Well, I mean, the thing that we see often that I hear from many faculty is that a student comes up to them, some woman says, oh my God, oh, I'm not doing very well. Man comes up, I've got this under control. <laughs> and she's actually doing better than he is. So right. it's a confidence level thing. Um, it's not so much that they aren't doing well and that that bothers them, it's that they're they don't think they're doing well, and they are doing well. Right, right. And so why is that? You know, why is that? Why is that? I, I don't know, but it's certainly it's very well documented. I mean, right. there are you know, sociologists that have studied these kinds of effects. And, um, and so I, mean, I think that the kinds of positive um, approaches, for instance, like what you did at, at Harvey Mudd, is to, to do something about that, to, to take the people that you know, are the, uh, the ones that are speaking out the most and have a side conversation with them. That's a great idea. So there are a variety of, of things that one could try out as, um, as trials for, for what might work. Um, but first you have to know that it really is happening, and then you can come up with ways to combat it. Right. And I do think that, um, that women haven't been allowed to fail, and in science right. you've got to be right. able to fail. Right. And I think it, they were right. If they failed, they were out. I see men fail. I thought, oh my gosh, that's the end of his career. Not at all. We can't let Joe fail. They got to pick Joe up and bring him back in the fold. <laughs> there's a woman's out. So there's a reason. Uh, most of these reactions turn out to be based on realities. Right. In fact, the women are wi wisely perceiving why they should behave a certain way. It's scary to ask for a salary, high salary, because you'll be you, people will hate you if you do. You know, there are different reactions going on, and that's why they behave the way they do. So blaming the women is often turns out not, absolutely not yeah. Me. So fear of failure can be irrational, a quite it, rational exactly. fear. Exactly, I think yes. so. Yeah. So let me open it up to to questions. You had your hand up first. Uh, someone was coming around with the mic, and um, I we're doing a pretty good job of actually. <laughs> I've been teaching for twenty years, so I have a loud voice. <laughs> I, um, before uh, before beginning my academic career, uh, I actually had another career working for the government, writing affirmative action regulations and enforcing them in colleges and universities. Um, uh, we had a, a women's Thank equity you. action yes. league suit, uh, and I've been through uh, been sitting through a lot of these discussions lately. And I don't hear people talk about this much anymore. I know that affirmative action has kind of a bad bad rep in many colleges and universities, but I still think it's important for people to know about that the fact that the executive order still applies to colleges and universities. They still have to have to be concerned about, um, about uh, hiring women and minorities if they're underrepresented. And why don't we talk about this more? So about, Title IX, people think of Title as a IX as well, thing, but yes. it's actually, it actually has, has had effect um, throughout uh, academia as well. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not sure why it's not talked about more. You know, I think there were two kinds of affirmative action. One said we have to lower the standard to make the, to make diversity happen. The other one was, you know, that you don't lower the standard, but you make an effort to actually bring people in who look different. And I think that that they need almost different names. And I think you need the second kind all the time. You absolutely have to go and work at it because we know now that women are constantly undervalued. So if you don't compensate for that, they're not gonna be there in, the, in numbers that they deserve to be there. So we need affirmative action to counteract the unconscious bias that holds them back. Um, in the, with the black, um, I can see your sleeve. <laughs> hey, I'll stand up if that's better. Um, so uh, this is Washington, and in the end, a lot of it is always about money. Um, you're both in bio, the meta, biomedical field, um, and we've seen a disinvestment from the federal government in, in this field. Uh, the NIH's budget has been flat, and we saw a cut last year. 
And I think, you know, we're gonna look back in a few years if this disinvestment continues and see that the impact for young investigators, women, and other minorities, that's the, that's the group that's gonna see the biggest cuts in these funding. And I'm wondering your experience with your, your, your labs now, your graduate students, are you starting to see this? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I would, I would predict the same thing. And I think that um, part of the reason that there is this leaky pipeline uh, anyway, um, at least in the field that I'm in, is that um, it is overly hyper-competitive, the field in general, way more so than it needs to be to do good science. Um, and um, there are a lot of things that go on in terms of getting papers published and playing games and pushing that has nothing to do with how good your science is. Um, and a lot of the women just decide, I don't want to play that game anymore. When it gets to be that kind of uh, just you have to fight for everything. And so for the same reason with the grants getting harder and harder to get, um, we're reading in the, in the papers now all the time about how a lot of people are shutting down their labs. And my prediction would be, based on what I've seen, is that there would be a disproportionate number of women and minorities in that group. Right here. Hi, thank you very much. It's a real treat to hear you. So I've been following this field for about 35 years, and attributional styles have been around for a long time. You know, the boy fails the test in math. He says, oh, such a dumb test, stupid teacher. You know, the girl fails the eighth grade math test and says, I'm so dumb. So beyond that, I think, Nancy, what you did at MIT, and I often think about it sort of unwittingly <laughs> propelling you into this world of, of gender equity, but providing them with the data and then starting this you know, front page New York Times article about it, et cetera, and, and this whole ball rolling for higher education made all the difference in the world because when you have a gender agenda, things change and they change radically. So I wondered, why uh, we can't have a gender agenda for the boards of those biotech pe companies. Why not, right, <laughs> you know, start that agenda on the boards? Yes, I think we have to do this. I think, you know, we have to somehow, people have to understand, diversity is here to stay. The workplace has to be a diverse place. I think about this, you know, if you want to be with people who look just like you, although this room is a lot of women, but, um, you know, you join a country club. But if you want to be in a workplace, it's got to reflect the people we're training and the people. And somehow we have to get to these people. I mean, I look at these computer companies and what are these people thinking? What are they thinking? <laughs> this is unacceptable. So how do we make right. that happen? And it's not just biotech boards, right? I mean, it's the Twitter when 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 Twitter's IPO happened, it yeah. emerged that yeah. um, that that there was a fair amount of tweeting. How do we put pressure on these uh, people? I've talked to venture capitalists, and uh, you know, they uh, <laughs> just forget them. In fact, and so I talked to the people starting the biotech companies. Oh, it's the fault of the venture capitalists. Well, you know, it's all their faults. And um, they're really um, leveraging, you know, really what's all come out of government-sponsored research, really, um, in the biotech field anyway, and doing this, which I consider to be anti-affirmative. I mean, it's illegal. <laughs> it should be. Uh, I don't know how you bring pressure well, on these people. The gender diversity for their boards, right? How do you put If pressure? the funding agency oh, would look people. at the advisory oh, boards. So those private. private. They're private. It's very tough. All right, I think we have time for one more question, uh, and I can see a, a beige or gray sleeve. That, uh, yeah. Hi. So uh, I was curious about the phrase that you use, the cumulative effects of a little bit of marginalization. And I'm curious about the slippery slope when you go from marginalization to discrimination and the really negative stigma there is against women who stand up for themselves, who advocate for themselves when they are pretty sure that something afoul is going on, not to the point where a whole university takes on a Title IX case or goes to the Office for Civil Rights, but when an individual woman is pretty sure that there's something going on, and I wonder what your advice would be to give to young women and to women in any stage of their career. If they're pretty sure that that's going on, what would be the right course of action to make sure that we're not just accepting marginalization in the guise of a larger discrimination issue? find allies. I mean, I'm not sure if you're talking about a specific case, like there's a specific woman who has an issue that happened with her. If that was at my university, I would you know, advise her to uh, talk to people around her, talk to you know, women department chairs or, or other people and find allies to then go to the administration with it. Um, that 
um, you know, sometimes just talking as one voice doesn't work as well. Although I think you did it as one voice. So no, so. no, no. I mean, we could we uh, at MIT. Uh, I mean, I was mad enough that I was willing to do whatever I was needed. But but um, really, it was the women getting together and staying together and speaking as one voice that gave that. And and it was those so those women. There were sixteen of us. Four of those women today have won the United States National Medal of Science, and three quarters of them are members of the National Academy of Sciences. So these were serious people, and when you have six, you know, all but one of the tenured women faculty joined that group and spoke as one, that's real power, actually. And of course, we had a great president and a great dean, so we were just incredibly. But I, you know, it's now almost 20 years since we started, and. Almost certainly no week goes by that I don't hear from people in the situation you're in. And it's still very difficult to know, and each situation requires a different thing. I mean, if you can get a group of people, and allies. And allies, that's your best bet. But it's a really tough situation still. Well, thank you so much, both of you. I really can't thank you enough. Um, and we will keep the conversation going now with our, with our next panel and our set of moderators. Thank you so much.